very good afternoon to those of you in Europe. And on behalf of Michael Keating and myself, we are delighted to have you there with us. <clears throat> Berkhoff and EIP are sister organizations and mainly involved in conflict, but also deeply committed to environmental issues. And we are working together to see how we can align those issues, sets of issues more. Now, in, in preparation for this meeting, I tried to do some historical research into water wars, but I was able to find only one war that was ever explicitly started over water. And that was 4,500 years ago. So one may be forgiven for <laughs> thinking that given that since the time of Abraham, there's only, there've been fewer wars fought about water than there have been about football matches for example, the Honduras Salvador War, 1969. One could be forgiven for thinking, why are we banging on so much about water security? Well, the reason is because water does represent an absolutely profound threat to future peace and security. And that has been growing in recent years. And the combination of, of climate change and massive population growth, particularly in arid areas has made this the case. Yemen is a country that we, that both Merkov and EIP are very, very committed to. It's a major priority for us both. And it, it, there's no way that, that we can probably get peace and security there until both the war is, is resolved and also the water sets of issues. As early as 1979, President Sadat was saying that if Egypt was ever involved in a future war, it would almost certainly be about water. And indeed, a series of UN Secretary Generals from Boutros Ghali onwards have rightly, in my view, warned about the dangers of water conflict. Conflicts are almost, or are frequently about resources and almost invariably about human rights. And sometimes, the combination of the two wars are provoked by the, the rights to resources the in, or the inequitable sharing of resources. And, but that this isn't the topic for today. We, we want to talk about not so much as to why water is a potential threat, but how it could actually be a potential door opener to mediators and to peacemakers. During today's discussion, I hope participants will use the Q&A function that you will find at the bottom of your screen. As often in these events, we, uh, we run out of time and not all questions can be answered, but in any case, we will answer as many as possible. They will be filtered through moderator and, and fed to the, the panelists. I am actually delighted to present to you as a keynote speaker um, Kai Sawa, now the Under Secretary, was the um, Ambassador of Finland to, to the United Nations and is now the Under Secretary for Foreign Policy and Security. He is a formidable presence, not only in the halls of power, but also on the ice hockey rink. And it is a great pleasure to have him. Kai, thank you for joining us today, and the, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, and thanks, Andrew. Uh, thanks, Berghoff and um, EIP. Thank you, Michael, for, for inviting me uh, to share some experiences from the Finnish uh, perspective of the, the water diplomacy and um, wa water uh, uh, me mediation. Uh, you, you really done your, your research, uh, Andrew. Uh, that reference to the hockey uh, um, sort of knocked me off the of the couch here but um, there's a water connection as well uh, since uh, in the early days uh, when the winters were still cold in, in Finland we had a lot of uh, kind of uh, natural ice and uh, every kid practiced uh, practiced hockey in the on the hockey rink which was actually frozen water now it's all artificial but uh, back in the days it was uh, all kind of organic um, it's also good to see old friends, uh, Robert from the International Committee of uh, Red Cross and um, 
also Alex Rondos, who I, I know he's very busy in the in the Horn of Africa, actually trying to solve a, a water related uh, a potential potential conflict. So, uh, as you said, Andrew, wa water is uh, quite quite essential in, in many ways. It's a fundamental uh, to, to human life and ecosystems. It is 60% of our, our body is, is water. It is essential uh, for our food security and uh, it can be essential for our energy pro production, transportation, uh, etc. Et Etc. So, although uh, Andrew, you said uh, it has so far caused only um, only one uh, war, uh, it definitely has uh, the potential uh, to to trigger uh, more uh, conflicts. But at the same time, it can also be a, a powerful motivation for for peace and uh, co cooperation. Uh, then, uh, dear friends, we all know that uh, climate change is a threat uh, multiplier for international peace and security. And it is age plays either a direct or indirect role will increase in the in the future. This is because together with uh, other effects of climate change, such as environmental degradation, and the loss of biodiversity, there's a growing concern for deterioration of the world's water resources and ecosystems. As the threat of water scarcity spreads, tensions and conflicts over access to and use of water are on the rise. The current situation of the Nile is a good example. Egypt, Sudan and Ethiopia are in negotiations on the major Dam construction in Ethiopia, as countries and within the countries are increasing. At the same time, in some cases, it can be argued that the real problem Kaiser, please can you unmute yourself? So I guess this would uh, constitute the second category of countries which never go to war uh, with each other. Uh, the first one being the democracies or full-fledged uh, democracies. Transboundary lake and river basins account for an estimated 60% of global freshwater flow and are home to 40% of the world's population. This should be seen as an opportunity for cooperation between and among neighboring countries. Water has the potential to play an important geopolitical role as it is the only natural resource that crosses country, country borders in a concrete and easily manageable and measurable uh, manner. There are several ways in which improved transboundary water management arrangements may bring about benefits for people living within shared water basins. To name one, more equitable and efficient water sharing amongst farmers across borders can lead to more sustainable water use and more secure yields. Friends, uh, the concept of water diplomacy has gained increasing international uh, prominence over the past years. In 2018, the Council of the European Union adopted uh, a Council conclusions on water diplomacy. It is also discussed at multilateral fora, such as the United Nations, the OSCE, and the African Union. Identified as one of the areas that could be further developed as part of proactive and preventive mediation. Water for peace is the third pillar of the Finnish water strategy, from, uh, it, which was launched in 2018. And the newly established Center for Peace Mediation at the Foreign Ministry has set water diplomacy as one of its key priorities. To further strengthen our water diplomacy, we have established a water diplomacy network together with the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry and the Ministry of, of uh, Environment. This multi-skilled group 
actors can provide support to water-related processes by ensuring the relevant actors in both peace mediation and water sector are reached. This network is yet another example of how we can bridge different ministries, institutions, and civil society organizations to work, I guess, in the diplomatic jar jargon that this would uh, be called like multi-stakeholder uh, coordination or interagency uh, coordination. Anyway, our experience of this uh, coordination work has been positive. Internationally, Finland has been an active player in the development of international agreements on transboundary water management since the 1960s. Our own transboundary water cooperation has also proved to be quite effective. And this might uh, surprise you, but the Finnish-Russian transboundary water cooperation has been recognized as one of the best in the world. This, is, this was uh, uh, certified by an independent international uh, study. The Finnish-Russian agreement on the utilization of transboundary water courses was signed in 1964 and is still functional after nearly 60 years. It sets out the principles for the use of transboundary rivers and lakes shared by the two states and the good cooperation is maintained through constant collaboration related to the use, the management and protection of the waters. The agreement is in line with contemporary principles. First, it covers all water crossing the border. And second, it is of comprehensive nature concerning all relevant issues such as discharge management, flood and drought control, water quality and fish migration. Fish migration, uh, data and information exchange and even potential consequences for public health and economy. River Vuoksi, V-U-O-K-S-I, Vuoksi, one of the biggest river basins along the common border with Russia, has important hydropower dams in both countries, and their regulation capacity is crucial for flood and drought control, and the transboundary water agreement between the two countries includes clear trade-off analysis and compensation mechanisms that run both ways. Ever since, uh, Finland has played quite an active role in global transboundary water issues by supporting the development of common legal framework and institutional development, and by tra transboundary water cooperation in the Nile Basin, Mekong region, and Central Asia. We have had a key role in establishing and we are party to both global conventions on transboundary waters, the 92, 1992 UNECE Water Convention, so-called Helsinki Convention, and the UN Convention on the Law of Non-Navigational Uses of International New York Water Courses Convention from 1997. Our wider experience shows that the effective and equitable governance of shared natural resources and fairer distribution of the joint economic, social and political benefits from the use of those resources among communities, regions and countries can effectively prevent conflicts at all levels and are tokens of sustainable peace. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, peace mediation, conflict prevention and peace building our priorities of Finnish foreign policy. Our approach to mediation is holistic. It emphasizes inclusivity and partnerships. It covers conflict prevention and promotion of national dialogues, as well as participation of women and youth in peace processes. As conflicts are becoming more complex and multidimensional, we underline the importance of coordination between peace building humanitarian assistance and development cooperation, and the support of mediation activities in multilateral fora. Currently, we are looking for ways to increase our participation in different mediation and dialogue processes related to water. We are reinforcing our capacity in our water diplomacy network, and we are intensifying our network 
with relevant Finnish and international partners and building on our strengths. So this webinar is a great uh, tool and example of what this outreach can be. I'm looking forward to a good discussion and uh, for further cooperation with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kai, for laying out the issues and also bringing to bear um, Finland's tremendous expertise that it has built up over the years on this topic. So now back to our co-convener, uh, Michael Keating, head of the European Institute of Peace. Michael. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andrew. And let me begin by saying happy 50th birthday to Birkhoff. Uh, I know this is one of the events you're organizing to celebrate that. So many congratulations. And uh, we are really delighted to be uh, co-hosting uh, this with you. And let me thank Kai too uh, for what he has said. Uh, and it is great to know that Finland is actively looking for ways to increase its involvement uh, in disputes uh, that involve water and bring its commitment uh, and experience to bear, because I suspect that's going to be increasingly valuable uh, in the years ahead. Uh, my job is to moderate uh, the conversation over the next hour. Uh, and what we are going to do is hear from uh, Nada Majdalani, who is the director of the Palestine Office of Eco Peace. Middle East. She will speak to us for up to 10 minutes. And then we're going to have a panel discussion with three uh, very distinguished uh, speakers, uh, all of whom I've had the privilege of knowing for many years. Uh, one is Robert Mardini, the Director General of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Great to have you with us, Robert. I, I, I know how busy you uh, have to be right now. I'm all, I almost feel guilty that we're taking up your time, but it's a measure of how much importance you attach to this, that you've accepted this invitation. So thank you. Secondly, uh, Habiba Sarabi, who I've also known for many years. Uh, I first met her when she was governor of Bamiyan province in Afghanistan, but she is an environmental uh, advocate uh, uh, and has been recognized for her work. Uh, on environmental issues. She is also one of the few female members of the Republic of Afghanistan's negotiating teams right now, um, engaging uh, in talks, intra-Afghan negotiations with the Taliban. So again, Habiba, thank you so much uh, for taking the time out to join us. Uh, and then we have Alex Rondos, the EU Special Representative to the Horn of Africa, who has vast experience around the world and most recently uh, in the Horn, which I suspect everybody in this call knows is facing a very serious set of uh, issues, many of which in one way or other uh, do relate to access management uh, uh, and control of water resources. So that discussion, uh, the moderated discussion, and as Andrew said, my job will be to be receiving questions from the floor uh, and putting them to the speaker, to each of the panelists. I'll give each of the panelists three or four minutes each, no more, just to kick off their remarks. And then I hope we'll have a very lively discussion. Um, I'm not going to uh, talk about water and conflict because uh, Kai has done that, Andrew's done that, and I know Nada has done that. But I have to say, I am, uh, positively uh, impressed uh, to hear that the, the story uh, of uh, water uh, is actually quite a good one in terms of conflict management. Uh, but I suspect that in the coming years, uh, we are going to see enormous uh, pressure put on water resources, even though the planet is 70% uh, watery. Uh, as I think everyone knows, only 2% of that is fresh water, and much of that is inaccessible, poorly and inequitably managed and distributed, and is in increasing demand uh, as a result of the things that have been talked about, population growth, uh, changing temperatures, 
and so on. And water is also being used increasingly in conflict despite international law uh, with devastating humanitarian consequences. So I guess what we really want to do in this uh, webinar is look at how the positive experiences are relevant to many of the problems coming down the track right now. What are the ways in which that experience can be used and deployed? Uh, and what are the entry points, uh, not just in managing disputes that are patently over water themselves, but whether common interest in water management can be used as an entry point for dialogue uh, between communities, between countries, and in regions that have many other political problems. I mean, can water actually help reframe some of the issues? And I can't resist just before passing over to Nada to say that the Institute has done a study, which I think uh, one of my colleagues I hope can put on the uh, chat uh, entitled um, uh, Making uh, Peace with the Climate, which looks at conflict resolution uh, and the entry points that an understanding of environmental degradation and climate change afford. Uh, and the purpose of today is to zero in on the water uh, aspect of that. So let me turn now to Nada um, before we have our uh, panel discussion. Nada, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Michael, and uh, thank you uh, for Berg of uh, Foundation for this kind invitation. Uh, this is Nada Majdalani. I'm the Palestinian director of Ecopeace Middle East. And those who are not familiar with our organization, we are a 26-year-old uh, environmental peace-building organization that is focused on uh, Jordan, Palestine, and Israel, with three offices equally operating uh, in, in these countries. Um, and throughout the presentation, you would uh, basically um, understand further what we're trying to do and what we've been doing over the past 26 years. I'm going to start sharing my screen, um, which I cannot do. <laughs> Can you please enable me to share my screen for the presentation? Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, basically uh, what we are trying to propose as an organization uh, starting December uh, 2020 is a new concept for the Middle East, which is a green blue deal for Palestine, Israel and Jordan, which could basically extend towards uh, other areas of conflict and other basins in the Middle East, such as um, the Nile and Tigris and Euphrates. Uh, and potentially also build on the new geopolitical dynamics of also the uh, agreements between uh, uh, Palestine, uh, between Israel and the Gulf countries, um, and also building on several new developments. Uh, basically, the European New Deal, uh, Green Deal, uh, which is uh, um, a targeting until 2050 to uh, convert Europe into uh, a climate uh, uh, pioneering continent, and also with the green, uh, with the new uh, climate deal, which comes with uh, the new Biden administration in the U.S. Uh, so in December, we have released this new report and concept, which is the Green Blue Deal in the Middle East, and we've had several uh, champions from around the world uh, to speak at our event uh, at that day. Uh, including uh, um, uh, also His Excellency Pekka Havisto, the Foreign Minister of Finland, uh, who um, also we are very grateful for him for his championship uh, uh, on, uh, on our concept and what we're trying to do here in the region. Why we're thinking about this is because exactly of what Kai has mentioned uh, in terms of how regions uh, and how uh, think tanks look at regions of conflict uh, where there is water scarcity as a threat uh, as climate change as a threat multiplier. We have here the areas where they have uh, water scarcity in, in the Middle East and where basically conflicts are concentrated and we see somehow the correlation. 
in comparison to other countries of the world and other regions of the world, the Middle East is expected on, from now until the end of the century to deal with a four degrees Celsius um, increase in, in temperature in comparison to only one uh, Celsius to two Celsius in other regions of the world. This in water scarce areas is just a recipe for disaster uh, and is also uh, what we said is a potential spit multiplier. How the, does this correspond to the water quantities and, uh, and uh, precipitation? We would see also from now until the end of the century a shift in precipitation. Uh, we're going to deal with 30 to 40 percent of uh, decreased precipitation in the region. Um, and uh, winter uh, seasons will be shorter uh, uh, until the end, of this, the end of the century, as we can see here from a study that is published by the uh, Tel Aviv University. However, if we think of climate change as a threat multiplier and it has consequences on the region, we would like also to see how the region is interconnected and how if impacts of climate change are happening on one side uh, that potentially can be climate resilient uh, to uh, and cli resilient to climate impacts, uh, the other countries that are surrounding cannot um, uh, can still uh, be struggling from climate impacts um, and yet correspond to the overall instability of the region. And this is clear from the example that I'm showing here, which is uh, the Gaza Strip uh, here in this side and the, um, uh, the Israeli uh, communities um, uh, here on this side. Uh, what you see in the picture is basically uh, this red line is raw sewage uh, from Gaza because of consecutive years of blockade on Gaza and the inability of the authorities in Gaza to develop uh, wastewater treatment plants to treat the sewage of 2 million people and also to receive electricity and energy that is necessary to basically operate these plants. What is happening is actually over the past years that sewage uh, is uh, being dumped raw into the Mediterranean and contributing to the pollution of Israeli beaches and the closure of large desalination plants, one of them which contributes to around 20% of the drinking water of Israel. This shows the interconnectedness of environmental impacts and that environment and water do not recognize uh, political boundaries. And regardless of how much basically Israel is capable um, at this stage with the a booming of technology of desalination to protect itself from the impacts of climate change, the insecurity of its neighbors and particularly Palestine and Jordan will still have repercussions on Israel's uh, water security and security overall. And here's why we come and we propose four main pillars for the green, new, green blue deal for uh, the Middle East. The first pillar is basically an exchange of energy and water between Palestine, Israel, and Jordan, where Jordan has the comparative uh, uh, advantage to produce uh, large quantities of solar energy on its side. However, uh, where uh, it can also uh, uh, be able to, um, uh, from uh, that's also at uh, Israel and Gaza can produce desalinated water from the Mediterranean. And this exchange would create basically geopolitical benefits which um, create interdependencies between the three countries. This is very similar to basically the uh, proposal or uh, and, and the agreement of the coal and steel, which brought out the uh, European Union from the ashes of, uh, of uh, World War II. Uh, what we are aiming for is to basically utilize the most precious resources of our region, which are the sun and the sea. And with that, basically, we are capitalizing on what Israel is currently able to do and planning in terms of increasing its capacity in desalination, which is going to be doubled until 2050 or tripled even. Um, and in that sense, it makes um, more sense that uh, 
the uh, water security of uh, um, of uh, of the nation surrounding Israel needs to also be um, thought of because I I see it as the Titanic. You cannot once once the iceberg hits or once climate change hits the region, it will not be able to differentiate um, who is more uh, capable to deal with climate change issues and who is not. Um, and while Israel is, is enjoying its water security, the uh, uh, Palestinians and, is and Jordanians are struggling with their water security. And this uh, middle picture right in the middle is from Gaza, where two million people are basically not able to drink the water under their feet for several reasons, partly because of overpumping and partly because of the also Israeli restrictions where they cannot get enough water. Similarly, also, there's a lot of pressure on water resources on the Jordanian side. Uh, also, we have issues with transboundary streams and polluted transboundary streams between Israel and, Jord and, and Palestine. And uh, we have several issues that are relevant to the mismanagement of these uh, transboundary streams and no agreements that are governing how to deal with them and how to treat the sewage and how to basically also deal with the uh, cost of treating uh, the sewage on these streams. This puts us in uh, the, th the second pillar, which is very important uh, in our Green Blue Deal, which is um, a shift in the paradigm where the uh, thinking and the, um, uh, that was in 25 years ago when Oslo agreement was signed between the Palestinians and Israelis, is not relevant anymore, particularly that um, the, the water uh, issue was uh, held hostage uh, with the other five final status issues, which are very much difficult. And what we're looking at basically in the Green Blue Deal is to capitalize on some of the ideas that, we, that we're talking about in terms of the new developments in, uh, in, in water technology from non-conventional resources and the exchanges and water diplomacy uh, tracks in order for Palestinians to gain their fair share and water rights, but also to utilize um, uh, water diplomacy and gaining uh, basically, uh, um, uh, and putting uh, the parties around the table to discuss water issues, which are now the low hanging fruit is potentially also a trust building measure and a measure to basically test the goodwill of both sides to actually discuss the more other difficult issues. The other fourth uh, element is basically the Jordan River Basin. Uh, and the Jordan uh, River is basically demised also because uh, it's, of course, a, a shared water course. Uh, it's affecting the Dead Sea, of course, that is uh, somehow also a world wonder. Um, and um, it's uh, the demise of, uh, of, the Dead, of, the, uh, of the Jordan River is um, mostly created because of uh, the political conflict, but also uh, because of climate change. What we are proposing basically is a regional master plan that focuses on infrastructure on several sectors that are relevant to climate change, resilience and adaptation, including uh, in the water sector, sanitation, renew renewable energy uh, and agricultural innovation, which would shift basically the economic situation of the valley, particularly on the Jordanian and Palestinian side from a four billion US dollar economy to a $73 billion economy by 2050. And this requires a lot of cooperation uh, and understanding and knowledge exchange and know-how. Um, and the final pillar of uh, basically the Green Blue Deal is uh, education and awareness and working with the communities. We work with youth and our target uh, for the past four years is to reach out to 22,000 youth from the three countries to teach them about their water reality and their neighbor's water reality. And of course, also here on the right side, this is the, uh, a photo of, of mayors from Palestine, Israel and Jordan jumping into the Jordan River and telling their leadership and politicians that they are all 
um, uh, wanting to basically address the water issues and uh, and and the uh, climate change issues collectively and cooperatively. This is how we capitalize basically on the base uh, of our communities to actually also amplify their voices and amplify our message. Throughout all this work that we've done over the 26 years, we also capitalize on the um, international community interest and, and support. Uh, um, um, my colleagues and I, we addressed the Security Council uh, back in 2019, and we spoke about the very heart of these issues. Um, we also have, uh, and we're very thankful to His Excellency Pekka Havisto, uh, Finnish uh, Foreign Minister, who also is uh, championing uh, our Green Blue Deal. Um, once uh, uh, he actually gave a, a keynote in our uh, regional conference in 2020. Um, I would like to stop here because I don't want take, to take much of our time, but uh, basically what uh, we are proposing is not uh, at all different from what we actually are trying to do on the ground. We keep communicating and engaging with our stakeholders, with our communities um, to basically amplify our message in terms of uh, climate security and utilizing climate change not as a threat multiplier but actually as an opportunity um, multiplier for our region thank you so much i'll give the floor again to michael and the colleagues thank you very much nada so now i think i'm going to ask the uh, panelists to join us that is uh, robert uh, alex uh, and habiba uh, not quite sure how this is going to work uh, visually. Uh, a number of things uh, jumped out at me from what you said, uh, Nada, from a kind of political perspective. First of all, the point that you made uh, is that getting water management right increases economic opportunity for everyone. And it seems to me that's a very powerful argument, uh, but uh, I don't know whether it's uh, is a killer argument in terms of moving things forward. It also um, uh, made me wonder what you said, the degree to which conversations uh, about water are positively influencing broader political discussions uh, and whether that would be relevant in other parts of the world. Um, and I was also intrigued by the photo of all the mayors sitting in the pool I noticed they didn't have water pistols, which I suppose is a good thing. Um, but it did make me wonder whether, you know, the best way to try and encourage dialogue around water is at that level, at the municipal level, at the, at the local level, rather than at the national level. Anyway, we'll come back to many of these uh, points. I'm now going to turn to to Robert, and I don't know, Robert, if you if there's anything that uh, Nada said that you want to pick up on. But clearly, the thing that I would like to know from you is, um, you know, you have been on record very articulate about how water is being used uh, by parties to conflict, uh, to disable each other, to um, as, a, as being targeted. Is this getting worse? Are there trends that we are, we are witnessing? Uh, and, 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 you know, do you agree with the thesis that seems to be emerging already from this discussion that water can actually be a, for, a positive force for good, maybe even in humanitarian crises and conflict situations? Over to you, Robert. You're on mute. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, thank you, Nada, and thank you, uh, Andrew for having uh, me and uh, great to see my good friend Kai uh, who was always a very strong advocate of uh, international humanitarian law in uh, in uh, in New York uh, so um, uh, yes indeed uh, thank you Nada for giving us insight into the very interesting work uh, of your organization uh, it really reminded me of uh, my time at ICRT as a water engineer where we were trying to solve the wicked problem of the sewage in, in the Gaza Strip. And uh, 
clearly with the growth of population, the declining of water table, uh, higher salinity, uh, it's uh, still a work in progress and much more needs to be, uh, to be done. So maybe if I can kick off uh, with uh, the fact that from our practice, climate change uh, is not a direct cause for conflict, but in the absence of institutions able to mediate tensions and manage resources equitably, climate risk and environmental degradation may further fuel local tensions and instability and contribute to shaping dynamics of uh, violence. We see this materializing and happening uh, in Africa, in the Middle East, and in many places uh, we work. Uh, in some places, the actions of armed groups are such as deforestation or illegal mining cause environmental degradation that in turn make people more vulnerable and inflame uh, local tensions. So the ICRC's approach in a nutshell is to help conflict and violence affected communities become more resilient to environmental degradation and successive climate shocks to better understand how these risks affect uh, the communities with whom we work and how we can best support them. Um, uh, we conducted research for over a year in three contexts, uh, Northern Mali, uh, Central African Republic and, and Southern Iraq. So, Simply put, uh, in each of these contexts, we found that combined climate risk and conflict really disrupt all aspects of people's life. Uh, and this is true of their safety and health, their food, their water, and economic security. Uh, effects can be felt regionally or across borders, uh, impacting migration and access uh, to resources. So what can be done? Of course, we need concerted global efforts to limit climate change and avoid the worst effect for people and their environment. Uh, but at the same time, we urgently need to find ways to help people and communities adapt. Uh, we need to help build resilient communities alongside efforts to protect those communities from violence. Uh, so in the Middle East, for instance, where water scarcity can be particularly acute, we have done a long way in successfully adapting our water-related activities. So in places like Yemen, for example, we have progressively focused more on improving the management of water resources rather than digging for, for more water, which only exacerbates water threats. In places like Sada, you have a declining of the water table by six meters per year. Uh, so clearly, given the scale of the challenge, we need to work in partnership within and beyond the humanitarian sector. We also need to mobilize uh, those who are best placed to ensure that climate action and finance reach communities affected uh, by conflict. And it is also uh, a, a call for improving the implementation of the international humanitarian law rules protecting the natural environment during armed conflict. Uh, so greater respect for these rules would help limit environmental degradation and in turn reduce the climate risk that conflict affected communities uh, face. So, so now, uh, Michael, to your question, is water being uh, targeted by parties to conflict? Uh, and is this getting worse? Uh, what we're seeing at ICRC is a troubling trend, uh, actually, in which water, sanitation, and energy infrastructure is being destroyed, either through deliberate targeting or as a result of incidental damage, as well uh, as in some instances, water infrastructure being used as a political or military tool to achieve a particular uh, political or milit military objective. Uh, so using access to water as a tactic during conflict or targeting water, wastewater or energy facilities create immediate and long-term negative impacts on public health for already very vulnerable populations. The humanitarian consequences from such incidents also pose a risk for displacement, reduced livelihood and on the environment. So the urbanization of uh, armed conflict uh, is an undisputable trend also that we see. And when war moves to cities and other populated areas where civilians and combatants, civilian objects and military objectives are frequently intermingled or in close proximity, the risk of critical civilian infrastructure such as water, pumping stations or treatment plants damaged or destroyed is multiplied, especially when explosive weapons with wide area effects are used, which unfortunately is becoming the norms in places like Syria, Yemen, um, uh, the Central African Republic and elsewhere. So we are also witnessing incidents 
where essential services are misused. Uh, so parties to the conflict that have an ambition to control territory and govern over a population may opt not to destroy infrastructure, but rather shut off the service to deprive an entire population of access and to achieve a desired military or political advantage. This then allows them to turn the service back on after the hostilities have uh, ended. So to ensuring the continuity in the delivery of essential services, this requires uh, not only that civilian infrastructure is protected, but also that service provider personnel who operate, maintain and repair the infrastructure and the consumable, which are often stored in warehouses, are uh, also spared. Uh, so maybe I will leave it here. Um, okay, thank you, Rob. Now. That was that was very interesting and very relevant to our other speakers. And I'm going to come back to you on some of the maybe maybe they will and some of our participants. But let me turn to Habiba now. Again, uh, Hab Governor, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Uh, one of the most memorable experiences I had was going with you to a very remote community uh, in Afghanistan to open an environmental peace park, which was about trying to bring people together who may have lots of differences, but recognized uh, a common interest in management of environmental resources. So could I ask for uh, some of your thoughts on this, in particular, whether, you know, environmental and water management issues are used enough to promote uh, dialogue, uh, including uh, parties that are at conflict with each other. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, very good to see you uh, visually and uh, my greeting and uh, good evening to all the friends that friends that are watching us and, and uh, following us. So, uh, let me to talk a little bit that uh, about the uh, water management and and uh, in our system or in our culture that you have been talked about the uh, and one of the remote area like Bamiyan. So um, uh, unfortunately now it's damaged, but uh, uh, because water wa uh, is uh, very fundamental, very vital for every. Uh, uh, every person for uh, for life. So the, the the people in Afghanistan they recognized before that it is important. So they ma they made a kind of uh, traditionally traditionally manage among uh, among themselves. So one of the best management that they did it it was uh, we call the, the people called Mirau. Mirau means that the, the person that he is the not very elder of the, the village, but someone that he was able to manage how to distribute water uh, among the population because uh, they are not facing with the shortage of, shortage of, of water. But uh, because of conflict, because of war, Unfortunately, this uh, 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 traditional management, this traditional system is damaged. So it is now, unfortunately, one of the biggest uh, cause of con conflict in the, uh, in the um, uh, rural area. But of course, uh, it, it will be um, a, an issue that after the peace agreement, uh, because resource management and land management, these are something that we have to have a strategic plan, a clear policy for that, and a strategic plan for that to, uh, to that can be a part of uh, the peace agreement, the peace dialogue that how to manage that one. Uh, now, at the moment, unfortunately, Taliban are not caring a lot about this water management and land management because it's war, it's conflict. They wanted to uh, to use as much they want to do it. Uh, so, but uh, they are always thinking about ideology, how to uh, uh, how to fulfill their ideology to the population and to the government of Afghanistan. But anyway, this is uh, uh, this, uh, this can be a, a big part of the 
dialogue, a big part of the uh, uh, peace deal uh, for the uh, resource management, land management, and water management. Otherwise, the, uh, this, the, this century is the century, or uh, will be the century of shortage of water. So if that cannot be a part of the peace uh, deal and the, the dialogue, of course, after the peace deal, uh, uh, the Afghan people will face and the, uh, the uh, government of their peace will face a big problem with the shortage of water. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. And you've made two, to my mind, fundamental points. One is that in many societies, governance arrangements are actually built around the management and use of water. Uh, and Robert was talking about the, you know, the absence of institutions. Uh, and I would like to uh, suggest that includes the absence of local governance arrangements. They have been destroyed and many of them were rooted in water management itself. The second thing you've said is that unless these issues are part of the peace agreement between the Taliban and the Republic of Afghanistan, uh, then that peace agreement is going to be um, deeply imperfect and, and incomplete, and yet they are not being discussed. So to my mind, that only, I think, reinforces the notion that water needs to be more centrally included in political, in political discussions and in peace agreements. And it does beg the question as to whether that is possible and realistic, given how focused many of the parties to conflict are on um, power and on security. They're not really thinking about these things. Now, let me turn to Alex, who, uh, as ever, is on the move. He is always on the move, and he is literally on the move right now. I imagine, Alex, that some of the points that have been made by the previous speakers resonate with you as you think about what's happening in the in the hall. So I'd love to hear um, uh, what you have to say, uh, uh, in particular, the significance of water to relationships between some of the key actors uh, in the horn itself. Michael, thank you. Uh, can you hear me, first of all? Yes, we can. Good. I see you. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to just the car will park shortly because I fear I'll lose some signal in a minute. Um, now, I, thank you very much for having me on this. And I feel rather humbled, frankly, because I'm surrounded by real expertise. And uh, I can only offer some perspectives from my perch, which is a much more political one, I guess. Here are two or three thoughts. Um, I'm involved directly in the discussions on the, the Nile and the Dam. And I don't want to take you into the, into the details of that, but I must say uh, there is an astonishing sort of resonance in what I'm confronted by as an unresolved issue with what Nada was describing in the situation there in, 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 in the region, in the Middle East, and especially with um, Palestine, Israel, and the like. Now, two or three points I'd like to make fairly briefly for now. Uh, first, <clears throat> that it, I'm struck by one thing, that uh, in the Horn of Africa, we're really dealing with a single sole source of water, that is the highlands of Ethiopia, from which all the rivers rise and then descend. Um, this is the Blue Nile, the Shabele River into Somalia, the Omo heading down into Kenya. And I think people often forget the degree to which there's this single source, as it were, which has a direct impact on all these countries and huge populations. <clears throat> Second, uh, I worry that very often, whereas, and I think this is, speaks to the core of the question that um, is at the heart of this discussion, I, 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 there's a real danger the water issues, whether it is dams or the accessibility of water as it descends either into Sudan and Egypt or Kenya or Somalia, in a, in a, in a region where 
so much of the politics among the countries consists of how you use a deterrent, meaning um, how do you protect your neighbors? How do you look after your neighbor's dissident as a deterrent against your neighbor? When you get into complicated relationships, you will find that various assets are put to use. And one of my worries right now in the horn is that water can be used as a threat to neighbors. And we've got to find a way of turning this on its head. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I hope I'm not speaking. I, I hope this can be treated with the necessary confidence, but I do worry that the relationship between Sudan and Ethiopia today, um, the issue of the Nile and the GERD will be seen as just one of, a bar, of issues in a basket of an increasingly complicated relationship between two countries. And that's a bit like pressing a nuclear button when you do that. Um, that is what we really have to address. The Somalia and Kenya, I think it'll be an easier issue to, to deal with. So th there is an absolute fundamental need right now, as we speak, that the international community, for example, make absolutely clear that you cannot take you cannot take the politics that surrounds the construction of a dam and the subsequent flow of a river into something that is going to be used as a tool or a, or a, or a threat within, within a wider negotiation between two countries. If we don't start homing in on that question, um, we will have a heap of trouble down the road. Secondly, uh, I find dealing with the Nile, uh, it, it's absolutely fascinating because here I want to try to turn to what could be a more positive approach to things. It, it's, it's a mix of how do you deal with um, uh, law, hydrology, economics, and the clash of sovereignties? And it's how do we turn this into something more constructive? Now, in the GERD, uh, on the issue of the dam and, and the, the Blue Nile, I'm struck by the fact that we've all sort of, this all began backwards. Uh, in, if you think, step back and say in an ideal world, you'd look at the Blue Nile and say, how do we turn this river, which is a finite resource, this is the fundamental point, if not a diminishing resource because of climate change, how do we make sure we, we flip things so that a population of some 250 million people who in one way or another are largely dependent on the way this water is used of the River Nile, whatever aquifers there might be, and these are barely touched. How do we turn this into the, most, the best economic opportunity for these countries? What are the trade-offs between them? To what extent can Ethiopia generate electricity and do so wisely and, and get into the regional power grids. How does Sudan take advantage of an extra, in effect, an extra harvest, but not misuse the extra water? Because in effect, the, the, the dam is producing water that replaces the oil revenue that Sudan lost when South Sudan became independent. How does Egypt achieve water security in such a way that it begins to gradually shift strategically over a period, it, the use of its own water to minimize the degree to which it is dependent on the Nile. Because right now the narrative is everyone sees the, the Nile as the panacea. And my sense is this ain't going to last long enough for that. So my own suggestion would be it's time for the IFIs and everyone and it goes right down to local communities to look at what is the grand package that will actually match generation of electricity and energy, um, proper irrigation, and proper water security. And this involves high level politics, but at the same time, the willingness not to deal with this piecemeal, but look at how we, we take this as an entire zone and region, a base, and then ask ourselves, what is the real opportunity for economic development? related to the flow of this river and how do we not min uh, diminish what water there is and how do we diversify the economics. That to my mind is the way one can begin to incentivize 
a discussion, which at the moment is dancing on a pinhead, which is how, how should one manage the flow from a single dam? And I'm learned, but I think this is the only way we can begin to move forward. Thank you, and over back to you. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, it does beg the question, Alex, as to whether there is anything like the level of interstate cooperation that NADA uh, set out uh, that would allow, uh, you know, a consideration of these issues. And it's almost just a, 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 I don't know if you have the answer to this. I mean, are people from Ethiopia and Sudan and Egypt and Somalia and, you know, other countries talking to each other about these issues? Are, you know, even before you get to any kind of political agreement, I mean, to what degree uh, is there, are they being encouraged and supported uh, to think of water not as a zero sum game, but as a resource that can grow the pie for everyone and that create can create economic opportunities for everyone. And if you know it is the case that there are some very clever analysts doing this, well, that's that's great. But to what degree is it being socialized uh, in political discussions? And what needs to happen? Um, you know, what 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 can be done to make sure uh, that that happens? So. I'd like to come back to you on that. In the meantime, there's lots of questions coming in. There's one, um, uh, I'm gonna turn to Robert. Uh, there's one for Robert first um, uh, from uh, Ollie Brown, which is that given that armed groups are targeting water sources, do you think that peacekeeping operations should be given a mandate by the UN Security Council to protect water resource infrastructure uh, where this is taking place, Robert. Thank you, Michael, and thank you for the question. Uh, the problem is uh, there are so many instances where this is happening, given the fragmentation of armed conflict, the, the number of armed groups, and the, uh, the probability to have this type of incident that I'm, uh, I'm afraid that uh, uh, the Security Council won't be able to give mandate to uh, new peacekeeping forces to do this exclusively. Rather, I think for, uh, for us, uh, we continue to uh, invest in the dialogue with all armed groups. Uh, and I think the only compass for this dialogue should be international humanitarian law. And actually, when there is a dialogue, uh, this is more respected than other things in conflict. Uh, I mean, if we take places like Syria, I mean, we are all horrified by the, the devastation of now a decade of conflict in Syria, where we've seen hospitals being attacked and so forth. Uh, water uh, uh, facilities have been more spared because at the end of the day, everyone needs water and water in urban centers cross front lines. And uh, uh, and you can engage with parties to the conflict, government armed groups, uh, and if you have a dialogue, you can make a point that uh, this should not be uh, attacked. It doesn't work every time, uh, but it's, um, it's important to maintain uh, the pressure. And in internal conflict, which is the vast majority of conflict these days, uh, parties uh, think that this place will become under their control, so there is also a tactical incentive for them uh, maybe not to attack physically those uh, water uh, facilities. What happens, unfortunately, is the lack of uh, maintenance, uh, the lack of supplies, uh, the lack of electricity, which is uh, more targeted indeed, uh, that makes it more challenging. Um, yeah, I leave it here. Thank you. Well, that, that's very interesting. And I'm, I'm going to build on that to ask a question of Nada. Uh, and it comes from Wandra Kaufman, um, you know, and she points out, uh, as has as, as Robert in a way, that, you know, you can have conversations around water and perhaps they can be more uh, productive than uh, around other issues. Uh, but has it had any effect on cooperation 
in other areas between national governance, governments. Is there any evidence in your case, for example, that you know, relationships between Jordan, the Palestinian Authority, and of Israel have improved beyond the water management thing, or is this just a, a sort of you know, boutique issue which everyone's agreed to deal with, but carry on squabbling over absolutely everything else? Yeah. Well, definitely it's not as easy as it sounds. I mean, we can't just build a pink picture and assume that theoretically what we are talking about could actually, uh, you know, have uh, a clear cut uh, influence on ground with all the other political tensions. I mean, we've, uh, we've, we've had a long term agreement between uh, Israel and, and Jordan on water issues, which um, uh, which which happened, uh, of course, after the peace agreement between the two, uh, the two countries uh, over the uh, res uh, reservoir of the uh, the Lake of Galilee of uh, or Tabaraya uh, Lake, uh, where uh, the Jordanians have access to water from uh, from the lake um, uh, during the summer season, and where Israel has to store water during the winter season. This type of water diplomacy then started as an example to um, uh, also develop further when they started the talks about the Red Dead Canal. Um, and then later, the Palestinian uh, party also chipped into the conversations in terms of how to develop such a water diplomacy concept into a larger regional cooperation and stability security concept. Um, however, as, as we moved forward with this process, it did have um, the political and geopolitical dif difficulties did actually um, influence and impact moving forward on uh, actually the water diplom diplomacy efforts. So most of the time in practice, it is vice versa. It's the geopolitical difficulties that is actually Im impacting and negatively influencing the efforts for water diplomacy. However, this doesn't mean that we cannot move forward with this track. I mean, when we look at, for example, the concept of eco-peace um, to prioritize negotiating on water uh, for Palestinians, when Palestinians and Israelis negotiated water 25 years ago in Oslo, and they put it as one of the five final status uh, uh, issues along with refugees, with borders, with uh, with the illegal settlements, and uh, with, with the question of East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, the, whatever. We had a major problem, which was we were negotiating over water that is from nature resources alone. Today, we have abundance of non-conventional water resources, which are uh, mostly developed in, uh, on the Israeli shores, but also with the high potential to be developed in the Gaza Strip. If also, again, the political will um, uh, is pushed and the enabling environment is there. Right. If we, we, we tackle the water reallocation from nature resources and we tackle the Palestinian water rights as a, in a negotiated matter, we envision that this potentially can be a tool and an instrument that can lead to discussing the other more difficult issues. So in, this is in theory and it could happen in practice because on a second level and on the technical level, the parties do recognize the need for cooperation. It just needs the political will and the leadership. And on the other hand, even the security establishment in Israel believes that the, uh, and this is not my talk, this is the, the, um, uh, the, the evidence that my colleague Gidon Bromberg, the Israeli director of Ecopeace, brings all the time, that the Israeli uh, security establishment does recognize that the Palestinians need to uh, have access to water uh, and to stabilize their water system. I hope uh, I, I, I answered the question. Thank you, thank you. We, we only have, I, I'm uh, in, a, just before we end in 20 minutes, I will be asking uh, Suzanne Schmeyer, who's the Associate Professor in Water Law and Diplomacy uh, to give us some takeaways from this conversation. So I do want to try and pack in as much as possible in the next 10 minutes. And I have a question, one for Habiba and one for 
Alex, um, I'll give you both the questions. Uh, Habiba, the question is, uh, in a way, it's from Laurie Cooper, who is asking, he's asking the panelists, but I'm asking you. Uh, sorry, I, I'm so sorry. Uh, um, it's from Christoph Lutzmann, who is from the Center for Integrative Mediation in Berlin, is whether there is any interaction between peace negotiators and technical experts on one team. So I guess the question for you, Habiba, is are there any people who understand environment and water issues talking to the negotiation team uh, in Doha, whether it's the Taliban or whether it's uh, the uh, Republic negotiation team? Are there any kind of sidebar discussions about the importance of these issues from people who understand them, presumably with a view to uh, encouraging dialogue. And while you think about the answer, let me just tell uh, Alex uh, what the question for him is. And it's from Benjamin Paul of Adelphi, who says that the grand bargain sounds great, but this has been the objective of the Nile Basin Initiative for a couple of decades. Government's incentives don't correspond to their country's incentives. How can it be changed? How can governments be persuaded to pursue their interests rather than their positions? Let me start with Habiba. Any water or environmental technical experts enriching your discussions uh, in Doha? Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, you are working with us closely. We know each other, and also as a, um, an institute, uh, um, European Institute for Peace, we have got several uh, training program by uh, by your team. But unfortunately, as I said, the environmental issue, the water management, is not a priority in uh, for the Taliban. Uh, Taliban is mostly ideologically. Uh, they are fighting, so that's why they are not thinking about that. You know that the Taliban, they are not expert for many things, not for, uh, not for water, environment, neither for the science. And so that's why even among uh, the, our technical team, unfortunately, there is no one that to be expert on the uh, environmental issue, water management and, and the other environmental issue. I think this is very, very necessary. This is uh, 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 vital to have someone because after the peace agreement, these type of issue is something that we have to, to we have to think about that. Not only among the Afghans inside, but the the water issue is with our neighboring country. At the moment, we have some dispute between the for the water management between the uh, Af, uh, Afghan government and Iranian. So these are something that uh, it should be. I mean, even because the. Uh, uh, the negotiation and the peace process is not only among Afghan. This is a kind of regional, um, uh, regional dimension and regional interaction. So it is very necessary to have some some expert on that to uh, uh, to tackle with this uh, uh, water management dispute between the uh, Afghanistan government, Afghan government, and Iranian or other neighboring country and. Um, the, among ourselves or among the Taliban and Afghan government at the same time. Thank you. Well, thank you. And in a way, you're asking a question that's been put by someone called Iman Emir, who was asking about Iran uh, uh, and water. But you're saying that not only is there scope for negotiators uh, to be uh, briefed on these issues, but also to put this on the table when it comes to regional discussions to incentivize uh, peace agreements. Alex, the question to you was, how can governments be persuaded to pursue their interests rather than just to repeat their political positions? Are you still with us? I am, I am, I am. Um, uh, Michael, th this is not an easy one. Uh, we have, I've noticed in the course of these talks that actually um, with some good sharing, people do shift from, from their positions to acknowledging their interests. 
Uh, I think what we have is a different problem here. I think at a technical level, even at a legal one, there can be solutions found. What we've discovered, though, is because of the situation in the region, which has become much more fraught, to, uh, governments hide behind, or rather become hostage to their own rhetoric which in turn locks them in a corner from which it's more difficult to step out. Um, Ethiopia, for example, will say, why should it uh, surrender its sovereign right to develop water and water resources in the highlands? In other words, build more dams. And Egypt says, well, that will destroy the lives of, you know, 100 million Egyptians. The moment this enters the political rhetoric, um, it's very, as we all know, who've done politics, it's very difficult to walk back from that. And so we're at a stage right now, <clears throat> moment, the Congolese have taken over the, the chairing of the AU. In a few days, they will chair the first session, bringing the various parties together and those of us who are meant to be observers and then see, but they're going to do something which is the first time since COVID began everyone is going to meet in person. Um, and there's, there's no doubt in my mind that it is a meetings in person that are going to start changing the atmospherics. Um, I've, I've rarely found something less conducive to um, getting to people to move to discussing their real interests and doing that virtually. And, and, and so this crisis is victim to COVID in many ways as well as just, you know, some good degree of belligerence floating around at the moment. But um, if we can move it back to just quiet discussions where people can pull out and talk, this is practical stuff, I think we may be able to begin to find uh, a, a way through. That to me is, is, is the major thing. If I may just um, go back to an earlier question that you had mentioned, the cooperation and institutions in, in the region. Yes, there are, but they're insufficient. It's as simple as that. Um, the, the economic cooperation, the degrees of quality of legal advice among the countries is good, but I think there's much more work needed there. And then related to the last question, matching technical and legal expertise with, if you will, the, the mediation and the political practitioners is, is absolutely vital. Um, because it's in that sort of feedback that starts to occur that we begin to find answers to solutions. Left to us who do politics, we tend to toxify, technicians detoxify. And I found that's a real interesting lesson I've, I've, I've learned from this, this last year's uh, discussions. Over to you. Thank you. Well, we're running out of time and I, I, I can see that Kai, uh, you are still with us, at least uh, my screen says you are. So I don't know if there's anything, Kai, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if there is anything you would like to jump in on on this point, uh, please just uh, feel, put, your, put your camera on and do so. If you don't, I'll assume you're, 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 you're uh, you know, just taking stock of the conversation that's taking place. Uh, unfortunately, we really are, uh, Kai, would you like to just jump in on anything you've heard? By the way, I think your opening remarks about Finland being willing to share its experience and network experience is so compelling and important. And I, that's one of the takeaways that I'm getting from this conversation. Uh, you know, a question I have is the degree to which uh, the knowledge of, of doing these things is being shared uh, and whether, whether that's something you think deserves further investment. Yes, well, th thank you, Michael. Um, not much really, really to add. I've been uh, Im impressed by the uh, depth and uh, uh, comprehensiveness and diversity of this, uh, this discussion and also the experience and the, the co concrete and practical examples the panelists and, and yourself have brought to the table. What uh, uh, I can only reiterate is that we are uh, remaining um, on the subject and developing our our own skills, uh, and at the same time uh, we will uh, share our 
experience uh, with, with with others and uh, i think this is a good uh, way to go forward in in, in partnership and um, indeed relying on eip and uh, berghoff and and uh, driving this uh, uh, portfolio thank you very much thank you kai um uh, there are other questions uh laurie cooper for example has been asked a question about treating water runoff that's been made unusable by multinational corporations. And that's an extremely interesting question. Unfortunately, I don't think we have time to answer that, but we haven't, you know, I'm grateful to her for bringing in the private sector dimension uh, because often, you know, we come from intergovernmental organizations or non-governmental organizations, and we may be insufficiently uh, attentive uh, to the role of the private sector, both in complicating things and indeed in contributing to solutions. Um, it is my, uh, uh, I think my, my job is coming to an end. I want to pass the floor now to, to Suzanne. Um, thank you so much, Suzanne, for agreeing to do some takeaway thoughts from us, not an easy, task because this has been quite a, a free uh, wheeling and wide ranging and as Kai said lots of interesting practical ideas but uh, tell us what do you what have you taking what are you taking away from this conversation yeah thanks a lot Michael and um, as you say it's indeed quite difficult to to come to the one and only conclusion so I'll focus on a few points um, we started off discussing what the risks of water conflict or water war actually are. And I would agree here that not only have we not seen water wars in the past, except for that one really far in the past, um, I also think that we won't see them in the future or that the likelihood of seeing water wars between states in the future is very low. However, that should not distract us from the fact that conflicts do happen below the threshold of war, even between states, and that have all sorts of negative repercussions on people's lives and livelihoods, on economic relations, trade relations, uh, regional stability, and so on. But even more, we shouldn't be forgetting that a lot of conflict and violence that happens over water water being the source of it or water being a driving factor in it happens at the subnational level. So where people are really suffering these days and where we really see violence and lives being lost over water is at the very local level, but increasingly also um, at the interprovincial level in federal states, for example, and Iran was mentioned by one of the people asking a question, and that's indeed one of the countries where we do see conflicts between different parts of the country over water. I think an, um, another important point that was made was about the role of governance capacity or the role of institutions and here i i think is really where the the core of the issue lies it is the capacity of institutions to adapt to hydrological change to economic change and so on that will determine whether increasing scarcity increasing demand and so on actually leads to to conflict to competition and to violence or not and i think that's exactly where the peace building community and many other communities come in and where also really the cooperation between the peace building community and the water management communities community matters because if you want to build or strengthen institutions that are able to deal with increasing pressure on water resources you need those that know about how to bring communities or users or conflicting parties together and you need those that know how to actually manage water and i think that's where we're still facing uh some challenges to put it mildly i'll come back uh, to that in a in a second i would like to pick up one other point that was mentioned it's the uh, the the chance or the need to include water and other natural resources in peace agreements and in negotiations over peace agreements i think that's that's really a great idea it's absolutely needed but as habiba mentioned for the case of afghanistan and as is also the case for many other places around the world, it's not really happening. And there are reasons for it. I mean, peace is something and the peace building community um, needs to act for very good reasons quickly. And water managers tend to be a bit slower. If we talk about water cooperation and look at processes, how water cooperation has been built in the Rhine River Basin, for example, one that's known these days for really good cooperation, it took 40 years to solve 
the problems there and not all are solved. And that's obviously not a time that peace can, can wait. So I think we, we have a bit of a, a gap here. I think another important point that was raised that is equally challenging though, is to enlarge the basket of benefits. So to move beyond water, a bit along what, what Nada has presented and bring in energy security, food security and other things. And I think it's very well known in the water, maybe not so much in the in the peace building community, that this is the way forward, moving beyond zero sum water allocation towards a larger basket of benefit. But then that would also require that we do not only need to bring the peace building and the water community together, but also the agricultural sector, the energy sector, and what other issues are important in the respective countries. So uh, it's probably needed, or I'm, I'm absolutely sure it's needed to, to come to long-term sustainable and peaceful solutions, but it makes things even more, more complicated, I'd say. And of course, what was also mentioned um, by a number of people was the role of the international community. And I think that is um, my third point, that is equally crucial. So the international community really can make a difference, but what we see here um, is also that there's definitely room for improvement when it comes to coordination, be it between different UN agencies, those on the humanitarian side, um, those on the development and those on the environmental side, but equally also between local NGOs in a certain country that work on the peace side or on the water side and, and how these can, can work together. And I think what's related and what is a very important question um, in this is for the international community, does it work? So the international community will only engage in water-based peace building if it actually works. And there is this increasing pressure, and especially in times of COVID with limited resources, should we invest in something um, that actually makes sense and it delivers? And I just want to briefly mention the example of the Sava Basin in Southeastern Europe, which after the Yugoslav Wars, where countries were basically at war, but water was selected as the first issue for them to cooperate on. And it worked. They signed an agreement over their river and that has really triggered cooperation way beyond. So I think to, <laughs> to finish with this uh, rather positive note, I think there's a really great potential to bring together water managers, peace builders and others to use water as a resource for peace. But it does require that we do work together, learn to speak each other's language, which I think is still a bit of a challenge, and learn to, to also work along the different timelines that we have, the different financial streams that we have, and so on. But I do think that ultimately, water managers working with peace building organizations and vice versa is the only way forward. And I hope today's event um, contributed to that. So thanks a lot, and over to you. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, my last task is to ask Habiba and Kai and Alex to put their cameras on because I gather the organizers would like uh, to take a, a, a photo if we if we can and others and Alex is there uh, that would be great so snap away whoever's taking photographs Andrew um, so uh, I I would like I think Andrew's going to do this but just in case he forgets thank you so much all of you for your terrific contributions over to you, Andrew, and thank you, Suzanne, for such a great, uh, you know, flyby of the main points that came out of this. Very, very useful. Andrew, back to you. No, nothing from me. Just a big thanks to you, Michael, and all of our guests. It has been a really great event. Many, many thanks. Okay, thank you all so much. Uh, have a good evening, good lunch, good morning, wherever you are. M most grateful to you. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you. Bye.